The goal of forensic investigation is to convict the guilty, clear the innocent, and find the truth in a nutshell. One woman, dubbed the mother of forensics, changed the trajectory of how this subject was taught forever. This is the story of Frances Glessner Lee. The redness needs to come down, Detective Squad. It is summer. It is the summer in the UK, which means it's shit, which means I'm going on holiday. So before we actually dive into the story, let me just tell you briefly, like, how I planned out the next couple of months for this channel. I basically booked a holiday about a few weeks ago, just on a whim, didn't plan anything, still don't have it planned. So I will be taking a break from the channel, for sure, for at least two weeks in the future. So when this video comes out, I will probably be already in Spain or like on the way there for about a week. And then when I come back, I plan to record, prepare, script other cases. Now, feasibly also, why I'm taking this kind of holiday is because of the next level burnout that I have been experiencing for the past, like, year or so. You know, doing the full-time thing or before doing four-day work weeks and then on top of that going home every single day, researching, doing deep dives, it takes a toll. So I almost <laughs> broke everything. So I will, from that point on after I return from holiday, do still deep dives, but I feel like the videos will come more sporadically. I'd rather do what A, I love doing, I'm good at, and B, what you like reading, listening, so that you don't have to read the books, but I do, because it makes me happy. And then tell you the stories and do, you know, multi-parters. So I'm just saying, expect a the name of the channel to change once i'm back to hopefully better reflect what i cover here the plan is maybe to change it to miles mysteries i still have no clue i don't know if somebody still comes with a better idea ping me in the comments and then second the videos are going to come in kind of sporadic intervals or rather it's going to be multi-parters so like one topic a month because that's what I can commit to, because I still want to read books, and that's kind of where I see this channel going. It's just what I like doing, it's what you like watching, it's a win-win kind of situation. And I also really need a holiday, so thank you for understanding and <laughs> respecting the wishes. And keep your eyes on the community tab. Tab? I don't know how to do this, guys. I'd love to do YouTube, you know it by now. Which brings me to this topic. Before holiday, I bought, I had the most random book purchase ever, okay? It wasn't random at all, I actually planned to <laughs> buy this. But this is definitely the moment where I was like, no, I'm gonna judge the book by its cover. It's going to be random, I'm going to judge by its cover, and I had no regrets. Because if you have been here for a while, you know that your homegirl here is obsessed with miniatures and is obsessed with the person we are talking about today. Because she has changed history. She, she's a badass. I love badass grandmas. I love it. I have my own, who I love and respect, and is my favorite family member. And then also, this woman was just so fucking smart, so talented. She stopped at nothing. Nothing! As you're going to find out today, because I read the bloody book all about her. If you have followed the podcast channel, you know I already did speak about Frances Glessner Lee, and that was kind of before reading the book, just with information available online, and then we looked at her dioramas, we looked at her miniatures, you're gonna find out everything about it, because today we're kind of doing the same thing. This is more of a hero story, more of a biographical approach, where I will tell you everything that I have read about Frances Glessner Lee, or kind of condensed, because there are so, so many details. This book is so good. Go buy it right the fuck now. And then in the middle of this story, or kind of towards the end, you're going to analyze two of her dioramas that are also included in the book. So, let me tell you, <laughs> once I wipe the sweat off of my face, the story of the badass bitch of the 20th century, when well, she was born in the 19th century. Listen, she has lived through some shit. I thought my great-grandma lived through shit. This woman today, what a fucking legend. So if you remember me covering this story before on the podcast channel, if you are familiar with the miniature killer plot on the CSI, you know that in particular what always fascinated me about Frances's background 
is how insanely rich she was, like her whole family. But before we actually get to that spot, let me tell you just a brief history of what is known as legal medicine. And when I say history, these are just like excerpts that were in the book. I didn't like really go digging. But you might first wonder what the hell is legal medicine? Because I, my dumbass didn't know. It's like, what do you mean legal medicine? And from my understanding, it is anything to do with inquests. So whether it is, you know, coroners, like what had happened after death? Is it accident or is it foul play? Any time when there's any suspicion where the case might go to court, and we're gonna speak about what courts were in 16,000s onwards, and basically then would need to lead to an outcome, would need to lead to the suspect. If I have gotten that wrong, well, then I might have gotten the whole biography of Francis's life wrong, and then please let me know in the comments, because maybe I was high when reading this, I don't know what to tell you. But that brings us to some stats, because did you know that one in five deaths are sudden and unexpected? So this means that the four out of five, there is something suspicious about them. Going back in history, in 1944, there were 283,000 questionable deaths. And no more than one or two percent, so a few thousands at most, were investigated by qualified medical examiners. So those would be the doctors that could actually look at people, look at cadavers, go through autopsy, and spot cause of death. What that actually means is completely nuts, which is how things were run up until really, I would say, 18,000 something, or even 19,000s, like, literally the period that we are going to be speaking about today of Francis's life. And that was that in 16,000s, for example, coroners didn't need the knowledge of medicine or the law. So the coroners would hold an inquest, right? Because it had to be done if it is one of the suspicious deaths. However, the people observing the body could be just like you and me somebody who had absolutely no degree. I just find that to be so, so ridiculous. Because the inquest consisted of the jury of 10 or 12 men. Of course, it was men, because, you know, 16,000 and onwards. Most of them would be illiterate on top of everything, on top of being men in general. They would be illiterate farmers. And many of them probably had also been, like, neighbors, family members of the person who had died, or also witnesses to the death. So technically, inquests, the way that they happened, you could be a murderer. You could be the person that actually murdered somebody. Be like, you know what? Mm -mm. It looks, it looks like, it looks like suicide to me. It looks just like an accident. Nothing really happened here. Like, how did it make sense? How did anything make sense before? Now, this group of random men is deciding on the faith of the deceased, is deciding on the faith of the person in front of them. And as the book spots, the jury had to get a good look at it, not just a quick peek. They would be requested to examine for the signs of violence and just the presence of the wounds. So everything that you would expect somebody with a degree, but this is just something else, because it's the people that have no degree. They're just observing the body. If now these people decide that that person had been murdered, well, then they have to have the inquest to find the name of the killer. So the coroner would actually be authorized to charge the accused and arrest them. And it was the duty then of the police officers, of the sheriff, to hold the accused in jail until trial. The coroners would also be the ones hearing confessions, confiscating all of the property, like possessions, home, and land, of those convicted and executed. They could also take deceased property, too. So, as you can see, there's only a couple of people with actual medical knowledge that are kind of deciding on more, like, the legalities of things, rather than actually examining those bodies, or rather holding inquests for other people to decide on that. And then the people who are making those decisions haven't been educated at all in that area, or rather at all as well, because they were quite literally illiterate at the time. So this would be the gap that one woman wanted to fill. 
once, you know, she was born, once she saw how things got done. So let's talk about Frances, the woman in question, that uh, her family called her Fanny. I will not, because I find it ridiculous. Because again, I'm not British, okay? Fanny just sounds like a dirty word to me. So Frances was born in 1878. As I already mentioned, Frances was born in a filthy rich family. Her brother preceded her and was born in 1871. His name is George. We're going to be speaking about George a bit later. However, when Frances was born, her dad was already a millionaire at the time, with a net worth of about 21 million pounds. And this is in today's currency. He was one of the wealthiest people in Chicago. And if you ask how, agriculture. So her dad worked for an agricultural company and then they have been merged and then he became, rather was elected a chairman of International Harvesters Executive Committee. Meaning that at the time that Francis and her brother were born, he already owned the piece of the largest manufacturing company in the world. And that set the whole family, Francis included, into a generational wealth. With that wealth, and especially about the period that we are talking about, like late 1800s, you can imagine what it entailed. The family was known to go and listen to Chicago Symphony Orchestra, most of the performances. They were also hugely into just self-improvement, whether it was cultural, whether it was intellectual. They would visit literary clubs. They enjoyed learning languages, acquiring fine furniture and different objects for their home. Which meant that Frances would be raised in comfort. There would be commissioned bookcases with all of those books that she could read from a very early age. And she would always be surrounded by books and art all throughout her life. Now, as if that wasn't enough, they would also have Holiday House. Rather, if I read that right, probably multiple throughout their life. This would be in a place called New Hampshire in Twin Mountains. However, this happened for a particular reason. Her brother, George, actually developed severe hay fever when he was only four years old. And now, by the time Francis was born, you know, the family obviously brought him to different doctors, and they advised them, well, you need to spend summers outside of this filthy city. He needs to actually be able to be in nature and breed. So, of course, logically, for millionaires, the most normal decision to make here is to buy a huge-ass house that was, again, like middle of nowhere. But this is like perfection when you are a child, like Frances would be. So when she was five years old, she was already known for different anecdotes, like befriending an abolitionist, this clergyman. And then like her family would kind of see her just going on walks and talking to this man who was a grown-up while Francis was five. She would say later about this that he took a fancy to me as I did to him. In the middle of the morning, in the middle of the morning, he would go into the bar for a lemonade and often took me with him. I would sit on his knee with a little glass of ice cold lemonade. Once her dad saw her just drinking lemonades with this grown-ass man, he said, well, this just isn't the best place to raise the children. If we are going to send them here over the summer, we might as well have a home on our own. And that is how they logically, of course, decided to just buy the home where they were staying as if it was nothing, because it wasn't for them. So they buy the land, which in today's money would have cost them over 200,000 pounds. They named the home The Rocks. And according to Littleton Gazette, it was the finest summer residence in the mountains, with one of the finest and most extensive views of any house in the mountains. It would become one of the most important places for Frances, for her upbringing. She even had two-room log cabin playhouse. It was picturesque. The way I imagine it is like Desperate Housewives, like Wisteria Lane, but in 1880s. And then you Google it and it looks exactly nothing like that. As for Frances's parents, her dad was in a corporate environment, really making, like, some serious money for the family. Whereas her mom was in different societies. So she would be in the decorative art society, different highbrow ones, like Fortnite Club. She would go for lessons in different languages and literature. 
for silver smithing lessons to refine her skills, for example, in jewelry making. She was famous for being a reader. She herself made a social circuit that was called the Monday Morning Reading Class. And it was just so obvious that when the family would return to Chicago eventually, once little Georgie's health was better, that this is going to be the lifestyle that she was going to lead, and where Frances is also going to pick up on certain things, like the fact that her mom would, you know, bring other people at home. She was the hostess with the most. She would organize all of these dinners, where then these ladies would come and would kind of be like a club where they would be knitting, sewing, doing all of these different different activities. And what would later be said about them doing this is the ladies' fingers were busy with sewing and other womanly occupation. And when the reading stopped, doubtless their tongues grew active in womanly conversation. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please. The mom wasn't the only one getting classes. Frances and her brother lacked nothing as they were growing up. They were given everything from lessons in horse riding, dance, music, art, private tutors. And you kind of get the feeling that, you know, yes, the brother was still educated for him to have a degree and have a job, but they never denied Frances any education as well. She would have as many private lessons and private tutors at home. Maybe the focus was more on, like, knitting and sewing and stuff, but this is also where little Frances would really find her talent, and she just never knew that her career is actually going to take her in that direction. Because you have to think about the premise of those lessons, and how, at that time especially for Frances, the goal was probably to just learn to do these all womanly activities for a particular person, to stay and be a housewife. However, nobody knew that she's going to learn these activities and then use them for something revolutionary. Little Frances was a great achiever. Like, everything from languages which she learned multiple. She learned German, French, and Latin, but also other skills. Knitting, crochet, other forms of needlework. She really found her talent there. And her dad would also note that even at a young age, she was great at just entertaining everybody. She was just a great conversationalist. And especially, and these are the best people, the best people, who can talk talk to grown-ups. If you were the person that has ever bonded with a grandparent that respects the elderly, immediate best friends. That's it. End of story. The best people just love their elderly, respect them, have a special bond with their grandparents, and I will now shut the fuck up about them, because they're simply the best. They don't need no more validation from a random girl <laughs> on a YouTube box. So, because she was also reading all of the books that were on those bookcases in her family house, Frances developed an interest in medicine from a very early age. And this is attributed probably to the books that were kind of designated for adults. Because it was said that as a child, she would be fascinated with mummies and the anatomical drawings of 16th century anatomists. So, I can only suppose that these would be like, you know, one of those huge encyclopedia-like books that your parents keep and nobody really reads. They're there just because they look great. And well, Frances would open them, and then she would get really fixated on just the anatomy of the bodies. However, this interest then developed for a completely different reason. That is kind of morbid and also absolutely nuts, because of when it happened and how it happened. So, when she was nine years old, she developed tonsillitis. And this is still late 1800s, okay? So, tonsillitis wasn't just like when I had it as a little child, where you go, you know, they put a mask on you, you are unconscious, they take them out. It was kind of a different procedure that would need to be done on Francis. And I am kind of stuttering because it is insane. You see, her mom had a consultation with the first surgeon, and this person told her that there was nothing to be done but remove Francis's tonsils, and that he would paint them with cocaine and snip them off. Now, I went into a weirdest, weirdest Google search of my life. I was typing tonsils, painting cocaine, snipping off, and um, surprise, nothing 
nothing popped up because it was 18,000. I don't think this is in the books as like the guide of how to cure tonsillitis. So fortunately, her mom actually went and got a second opinion from another doctor who said that he can do the surgery using an aesthetic agent. Literally, the book says, we don't know what happened. We have no idea what they have given little Francis. Like, could have been morphine, for all we know. Could have been cocaine. But her tonsils have been removed and everything was fine. Like, there was no complications after the operations. And little Francis even wrote a poem in gratitude to her doctor. And this is the most adorable thing, so I'm gonna read it out. Skip it if you don't want to listen to it, if you have no heart. Skip it. D is for Dr. Lincoln, of whom Fanny is constantly thinking. If he will come to the rocks, we will don our best frocks. A white one, a blue one, a pink one. My dear doctor, it is very hard to find a rhyme for your name, but I had to make a verse for you. So I have done my best all the same, and this is all that I can do. Your little friend, Fanny. From this cute moment, going into her teenage years, and just think about for a second, okay? Just pause this video. What did you do as a teenager? No, like, really, except from just make some very undesirable decisions that then change the pathway of your life. So, what did you do? Personal story? Shut it. Well, Frances was actually accompanying local doctors. So, in the summer, when she would go to the rocks, she was just befriending the doctors, and because of the time that it was, okay, let's not, let's not sugarcoat things. A lot of things in this story did happen because of what the time is when it was based, like early 1900s and late 1800s. However, Frances still showing that she's the legend that she was would accompany local doctors on the rounds, she would go visit patients, she would calm those patients down, but most importantly, she was actually observing what the doctors were doing. They were always wise, knowledgeable, kind, and comforting. Sometimes the doctors would also recruit Frances to assist with procedures and minor operations. She had no degree, by the way, BTW, but she would start using, you know, her skills, her hand skills. She would use the cabin kitchen to make different remedies, broths, nutritive wine jelly for the patients. Around this time, when Frances was still a teenager, her brother also started studying. And he started studying law at Harvard University. This is when he befriended another nerd who was a medical student that will make a huge impression in Frances's life. And this guy's name would be George McGrath. This is when everything we're talking about, this story kind of just goes in circle with Francis's friendship with George. So they started hanging out when Francis was 15 and George was at uni, so he was probably 18 and over. And the book states that there was never like any romance, anything like that between the two. They were quite interested in a lot of different things, everything really to do with legal medicine. So, at the time, way of identifying criminals was a huge problem. Names and appearances could have been changed and signatures faked. So, even when the police department started using photography, creating galleries of criminals, the images would often be useless for identification. Meaning the pair of them, Francis and George, got really interested in this exhibit that was done to the Parisian police where the French statistician and anthropologist showcased a bunch of photographs. He was trying to say that no two people are exactly alike. This statistician, this French statistician, Alphonse Bertillon, devised a system of recording five primary measurements. So, he would be looking at the length and width of the head, the length of the middle finger, the length of the left foot and the length of the forearm from the elbow to the extended middle finger. He named his system anthropometry, the measurement of humans, and it became known as Bertillonage or the Bertillon system and was adopted by the police at the time through Europe and through United States. The problem with this system is that it didn't really solve much. You still couldn't identify wanted criminals, you still couldn't really communicate between police stations, and this would have been the time when one of the faces in his gallery would have been the serial killer, H.H. H. Holmes, 
who was known for the murder castle where he basically built a hotel and then would lure people and torture them in these false hidden rooms behind the walls and nobody knew it for the longest amount of time. So the system in itself, the tyrannage, was far from ideal. It could only apply to adults because obviously the children would change when it comes to growth of everything that he would be measuring. And still, fingerprints weren't a thing. Like, they didn't exist. They didn't have something that would be universal. And also, they didn't have the communication between the police stations. Bertillonage and this guy's work would have been sort of the first introduction, or rather like confirmation of interest, for Francis and also George McGrath. But at this point, George is still at uni, and Frances turns 18. And for her 18th birthday, her rich parents sent her over to Europe. So she had the trip to Norway, the Netherlands, Germany, France, and she was away for a year, because while why the hell not? So she returns, and this is when the book just is like, yeah, we don't really know what the hell happened when she returned, but within months, she started keeping company with a 30-year-old attorney called Blewett. Okay, so the way I put into the script here, just like the sound of his name, the book makes him sound dead inside. Anyways, they got engaged. That was an understatement. She had about three children with him. Not about... What is about three children, Maya? <laughs> no, like three and a half kids. She had three kids with him. Still, he's the least memorable character in this bloody book. He was an attorney. Okay, what you need to know about Blewett, Blewett Lee. He was an attorney. Uh, they would get married. People would describe him as, like, a great guy, and they would say, like, oh, this is the loveliest couple ever. They looked so in love and stuff, but then behind closed doors, and not everything was really that great. It just seemed like Frances, at the time, really wanted to go to uni. She really did want to go to Harvard herself, but unis at the time weren't really accepting female students. So that was kind of already quashed when it comes to her mind. So, you know, she had to resort to the usual pathway at the time, which is get married, which is what she did when she was 20 years old. But, you know, this is not really what she intended to do. It just didn't feel right for her. And soon enough, she would realize that they had quite different interests. What kind of interest, you may wonder? This book deserves an award just for this paragraph. Single-handedly just give the, I don't know, Nobel Peace Prize, whatever Bruce deserves, just for this paragraph. Because relying on the assistance of his in-laws might easily have undermined Blavet's masculinity and his confidence as a breadwinner for the family. Frances resented the strings implicit in her acceptance of her parents' money, the insinuation of their presence and control in her life. She was also frustrated that she did not enjoy the independence and autonomy she thought would come with adulthood. He basically wasn't rich enough, okay? She grew up with, what, 21 millions at her disposal, everything she could wish for, and this guy just wasn't at that level. Sorry, sorry, Blavet. She still ended up, like, separating from him after the second child, and then they go back together, had the third one, and finally they would decide to separate, which would eventually end up in divorce. But not before a Chicago fire in 1903, which yet again would just kind of reinforce a memory in Frances's life that maybe there is a pathway that she should be following. The fire I'm referring to is known as the Iroquois Theater Fire that happened on December the 30th, 1903, at the so-named theater in Chicago. This is known as the deadliest theater fire and the deadliest single building fire in U.S. history, and it resulted in 602 deaths. So, the investigation, I looked into it to see, like, was there a culprit, but unfortunately, and this is so messed up, it seemed to have been just an accident. As in, there was a fire that was sparked by the arc light, and then it ignited scenery curtains. However, obviously, 600-plus people couldn't really get out in time. This fire made a huge impression on Frances. Her brother actually went to the theater to help recover the bodies, and at home, Frances was just keeping her children close to her. She said that the most heartbreaking thing was that the bodies 
some of them could never be identified. Again, because there was no system in place, there were no fingerprints. How can you even identify the bodies that have just been completely charred in this fire? After this incident, so now at this point Frances is in her 20s, and she decides to use the family wealth to buy a property that would be an hour drive away from the rocks. This would be in Forest Lake, and she called it Camp Lee, because this would have been her refuge away from her parents. So during the summer, she would bring the family there, and soon enough, after the divorce, well, she realized, as many people do, once they get rid of somebody who was bringing them down, her creative juices started flowing. That is somehow the most disgusting line that you have ever said on this channel. Creative juices, it's just the connotation. If you are not a perv, there's no connotation, Maya. It's creative juices. It's an innocent phrase. They started flowing. She started knitting and sewing again. And this time, she decided to actually use it for something. So the family was still very much associated with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. So her family, and especially Frances now, who was in her 20s, you know, she started being that hostess that her mom was before, she would, with her newfound skills, rather not really newfound because she grew up with them, started sketching these little miniatures of the orchestra in question. And this would be done to the unmatched detail. Everything from facial expressions of the dolls, that the dolls, by the way, why this story is so fascinating to me, is she would find materials. She would make these dolls as realistic as humanly possible. Like, imagine you're going to see an orchestra, you visualize all of the faces, and like, then you replicate them. You sew all of these dolls all together. It's like the X amount of males, X amount of females, 90 identical dolls, and then not just that, but the music sheets, the commanders, not called the commander, <laughs> I'm gonna die today, everything literally matched what she would see when she would go to see a performance. So she would build these miniatures and then bring people for dinners, you know, just bring them and in their honor, she would basically then demonstrate those miniatures to them. There would be dinners to view the miniatures, literally with a magnifying glass, where you could see the music on the paper within those miniatures. Every member of the organization, except three, was present, making, with the 15 or 16 other guests, 105 or 106, who sat down for dinner that was prepared in this house. There was a punch at the clothes and toasts and songs and a musical program before that was fine and humorous. The men were much interested in the little orchestra and in seeing themselves as others see them and went back again and again to the room over the parlor where it was and Frances Lee was fully satisfied for their appreciation. The members of the orchestra would even ask Frances for a picture as a remembrance of this occasion and she would also give them the models, the little dolls for keeps. So at this point it has been five years that Frances and Blewett whose name you will now hear for the very last time, because I hate saying it. You would think I'd like it. I don't, I really don't like this guy. I don't know who the hell he was. I just don't like him, because he didn't make Francis happy, okay? This marriage ends up in divorce. And at home now, she would kind of resort to other things in order to just divert her thoughts. A lot of them would just be cooking, knitting, like doing all of the womanly quote-unquote tasks. She would get really consumed by work, Work, and also she would kind of express these miniature making skills by just making other people in her life happy, especially her mom. Like for her mom's birthday, again, she would commit, and this is like time-consuming task, because you have to find everything from materials, you have to think about the scale of these miniatures, you have to think exactly like what props are you using, so if it is music notes, then you have to think about how you are going to put that on paper. If it is any sort of liquid, I don't know, if somebody's drinking wine, there's blood eventually, you have to think about how you are putting that onto that miniature. So for her mom's birthday, she would create another orchestra miniature. And still, at this point, as much as she would invest so much time 
to create this wonderful little orchestra, which is, again, a huge piece of art with 19 men and their instruments, doll size, all worked out in exquisite detail, and most of it done by Frances, his own fingers, herself, and nobody else. Nothing could be more complete or perfectly done, or more interesting. But just at the time, nobody still knew how much her whole life would revolve around these miniatures. Around this time, World War I breaks out. This is the sentence that the writer of the book used, and my mind immediately went places. So, Frances entertained sailors from Great Lakes at her Prairie Avenue home. Where does your dirty mind go when you read that line? Don't be shy, don't lie to it. We all, we all fought it. We all fought it. But no, it's actually the cutest, most innocent thing that you would have read in your freaking life. She would invite musicians, so she would invite the orchestra to entertain them. That was the entertainment part. And then she would just feed them. She would welcome them for dinner, for an evening of entertainment and socializing with talks and music provided by members of the orchestra. She would then basically make notes about them, about how they behaved, kind of giving them even like a little gold star next to their name if they behaved well. And then a lot of them, you know, got her address and started writing to her, and she would reward some of them who were considerate enough to write by sending a package of cookies in return. The book doesn't go in details as in, like, what happened beyond that. I would have liked to know, you know? It's just, the girl needs to move on from a guy named Bleuet. You said it would be the last time that you mentioned his name. And you failed. You failed miserably. In the post-war period, so speaking about 1918 here, Chicago Newspaper Society pages announced an unusual performance at the Chicago Art Institute called The Fingertip Theater. I couldn't find any pictures. I could find this advertised, but I was like, I needed pictures. God damn it. Because, as you could imagine, this would be, yes, the performance, this would be a theater-like performance, but the scale of it is a lot smaller, because it would be a miniature, created by none other than Frances Glessner Lee. The stage would measure just two by three feet, and would be about 20 inches in height. Tiny scenes would be created for each separate act during the show, and were perfect to the smallest detail. Yet again, Frances would invest her time, her money, considerable amount of money, because all of these miniatures would cost insane amount of money. But here, she did it in order to raise some serious funds. She raised with Fingertip Theater about 1,000 pounds for the fatherless children of France. This would be equivalent of around almost 13,000 today. And the Tribune would print a letter written by Lee thanking the Art Institute members for their generosity in providing the room, paying for lighting, paying for expenses. She said she was glad to have given her small efforts to this cause, and grateful to them and their kind notices. So far, we have Frances using her skills mostly to either raise funds or gift miniatures to her mom or entertain somebody. It is mostly done in a very generous way, but still, there's no, like, real purpose to her. And she knew she could do more than provide dinner, entertainment to sailors, and also host a benefit for a worthy cause. And this is where the guy that I told you to remember comes into play again, George McGrath. At this point, and this would have been 1920s, so George already finished his studies, and he was kind of losing his patience a bit because he saw what actually, in the field, his studies meant. So, medical examiners in the state still didn't have independent authority to investigate deaths. Under the law at the time, they were limited to investigating dead bodies of such persons only as are supposed to have come to their death by violence. Neither the law nor the courts ever bothered to define what was meant by supposed or by violence. 
McGrath always saw the weaknesses here, but he never cared for the usual practice of clinical medicine. He was interested in just different perspectives of broader health, and he used to travel quite a lot, and he would bring George, Francis's brother, along. About this, Francis would say George Glessner accompanied George McGrath countless times on his cases, always bringing home a living detective story all the more fascinating because it was true. Now, this would be true until George developed pneumonia and died at the age of 57. So, the period of her brother's death would, of course, be very much a low point for Frances. She sort of started becoming distant from, like, the extended family, and at this point her children were already grown up. She felt melancholic, and she herself actually had to go to a hospital. We don't really know why, but at this point, her friend McGrath was also hospitalized at the same time, at the same place. So, this is how they would reconnect. And Frances, being sly and smart, both at the same time, decides to start getting more involved into his examinations yet again. So, I think it was probably, you know, bonded by the death of the brother, bonded by this grief, that the two of them would reconnect. And the first case that they would actually go to, and when I say go to, I mean, Frances was on the crime scene. She actually worked side by side with George McGrath. And the case here is the one of Florence Arlene Small who was born in Brooklyn, in New York, in 1879. She married this Boston broker in Massachusetts, this guy called Frederick Small. And Florence and her husband would move to New Hampshire, which is going to be the house where she will end up dead. Her body would be found in the ruins of her home, in Mountain View, and the house would be destroyed by the fire. Now, due to the remoteness of the location, nobody really could intervene at the time. Even though the body was burned by the fire, the examiners would find a cord about her neck and a bullet wound over one eye and also wounds on the head. So, both of them are now on the scene of the crime. And McGrath would actually testify in court, because as we know, coroners then did literally everything. Frederick would deny responsibility for his wife's murder. And how McGrath actually got Frederick, it is that this guy just wasn't the smartest, so he would be the one who burned his wife's body after the bullet wound and the cord around the neck, and he burned the body in the bedroom, but now the bed had sunk into the basement, and that protected the body from, like, being further burned, so they could still examine quite a good portion of it. And also, Frederick was just, uh, sounded like a piece of shit, because he was a cheapskate as well. So, when Florence's body was sent to funeral parlor, well, he asked, is there even enough of the body to require a casket? Which is, like, a red flag number one. So, he just outed himself. However, McGrath actually managed to prove this autopsy-wise in court. He showed the jury the airway and how that was affected by strangulation, the signs of it, and also, like, the frame of the bed. So, he also said the psychology of Frederick was that he just never asked questions, like, how did my wife die, anything like that, and an innocent man would have been curious. So, because of McGrath's and Francis's work, Frederick would end up being convicted and executed. And here, what Francis would finally realize, you know, after all of these background things that were happening as she was growing up, as she was studying, as, you know, all of these kind of references are popping up in her head, it is that still the hardest thing to get across in the field of legal medicine, when it comes to the court, when it comes to actually prosecuting somebody, is the crime scene and the position of the body. Like, how those things are represented, because nobody else had ever seen crime scene. We kind of take it for granted today that, like, we have all of these shows and people have unrealistic expectations, yes, of them, but at this point, nobody else, apart from her, with her connections, would have actually been at the scene of the crime. So, they can't even really understand what has been happening. 
Francis still wouldn't really turn this into a vision for a number of years. In the meantime, she would be heavily networking. Due to her contacts, she started giving studies, comparing the coroners, comparing the ways that they had worked, and also now with McGrath's friends, with all of these coroners as well, they would put their heads together in order to create the foundation for a department of legal medicine. This was, at the time, however, going at the slowest pace possible. Francis really wanted the greatest education for everybody. At this point, only major cities would have introduced medical examiners, so it was going slow. The legislators still needed to understand the importance of instituting medical examiner systems and making them just work in the most effective way. Lawyers and judges needed to be educated about the nature of medical evidence, and then DAs needed to give medical examiners a hand, or rather a free rein, in order to decide which cases required an open autopsy. And finally, and not less importantly, and this will eventually be the area that she would breach into, the police needed to know what to do, and really what not to do, when it came to the scene of the violent or suspicious death. Most were not equipped to be thrown into the situation, again because they have never seen a scene of a crime, other than the ones that he visited, so they had nothing to learn from, nothing to really compare it to. This brings us to the early 1930s. By this point, Francis knew that state lawmakers needed to be convinced to abolish inquests and the office of coroner and adopt a medical examiner system. And she knew, obviously, there are all of these different angles that we have just spoken about. However, she really knew that there was one essential component where she could have some influence, and that would have been the police. The police officer was often the first person to arrive at the scene of death, and sometimes really the only person present. So the first few minutes could just really mean making or breaking the investigation, and the officers were the ones to have to be trained as to how to avoid compromising the crime scene. Due to her networking skills, due to her already knowing what people are into, and also being filthy rich, let's never forget that, she knew by this point that the way to really go about this was to offer Harvard some funding in exchange for something. When I'm saying some funding, it sounds like petty cash. It's about three million dollars in today's money. And the exchange was that she is to create a department or chair of legal medicine, which will bear the name of Dr. George McGrath, when it is proper. And also, she is to serve as his teaching assistant. Beyond becoming McGrath's teaching assistant, his right hand, getting an office, actually, at the Harvard University, reading all sorts of medical books, she also gets on the advisory board of the Institute of Medicine's Committee on Medical Legal Problems. There may have been a different drive for Frances beyond just her wanting to change history and to change how the inquests are done, and that was that at the time she was told she had an unknown ailment and she required surgery for it. The book states that this might have possibly been breast cancer. So she suddenly started pushing for everything, making plans just in case of her death. She would have met the director of medical sciences and also kind of emphasized to him that there's just not much progress that is made in the field of legal medicine. She wrote a whole proposal outlining the need for this kind of department. And at the time, she even got in touch with the FBI, or rather one such John Edgar Hoover. Not sure if you, you know really heard about this. This guy apparently was quite sexist, which doesn't really surprise me, especially considering the time we're talking about. But just around this time, when Frances suspected that she might be dying, and when she was really pushing at all fronts, just trying to get somebody to listen to her, 
to hear the need for the legal medicine, for this type of department to actually exist, for somebody to educate people on how to investigate crimes better, the Lindbergh kidnapping had happened. The Lindbergh baby kidnapping case had led the FBI to use the forensic evidence for the first time in order to convict the alleged kidnapper, and also allowed for the grounds for Federal Kidnapping Act to be passed. So, now the scientific expertise that was used during that investigation formed the basis for their technical lab. And here is where Francis basically saw the grounds to intervene, because now, you know, you have quite a few things that are going into her favor. So, she charmed her way, she met Hoover and toured the building. And this is the guy who apparently fired all of his female agents, so it just goes to say the power this woman had had, and how she knew how to play her cards. We don't really know what happened when it comes to her surgery, at least I might have skipped that in the book, like, did she have the surgery, was she completely fine afterwards? But at this point, two things happened that really push her into action. One of them was that McGrath decides to finally retire, and the second one was that Frances's dad died in 1936. So, she starts giving money to Harvard in order to create this department that she desperately wants, and she also decides to stay anonymous and for McGrath's name to be used, sort of as his legacy, because he basically pushed her into this whole industry. Despite of doing this, she also started getting more exposure, but rather in the right fields, in the fields where she actually wanted to go in. And at this point, I have to assume it wasn't just about McGrath. She kind of lived in this man's shadow. Like, yes, he pushed, you know, a couple of doors open for her, but she was always the assistant. She was always in this different type of role, compared to now, her seeing that it's finally her time to shine, and her time to actually use her skills. So, at first, she would conduct these exhibits for the Public Health and Medicine Building, and these would be a series of panels. It would be drawings illustrating common situations where medical examiner's expertise was needed. So, all of them would be hypothetical, and there would be kind of like a prompt. Death from gunshot wound. Was it suicide or homicide? Found dead in the water. Was it accident or murder? She finally had the time to also write a book. And this wasn't just like any book. I'll put it on the screen, but it was written in quite a different way. So, each two-page spread was intended to be regarded as a whole. This means that the ideal way was to read the heading on the right-hand page, if there was one, and then the Shakespearean quotations on the left page. Next, the reader would be directed to a marginal note, and marginal notes usually were employed as a sort of index in ancient texts. It was also said that this book was quite visual, that most organs of the human body would be represented, and that she selected art that was rich with symbolism, classical references, and images that had significance to her and that she thought would be useful to the public. At the beginning of the 1940s, she would also work to outline these different conferences that would be focused on medical legal knowledge. So, the intended audience here would have been doctors and medical students at different universities. And subjects were everything from causes of death, procedure in cases of different types, like accident, murder, to hospital cases, and also protection of evidence. Because, as you know, this would have been something that she really wanted targeted, because nobody really knew, you know, the chain of evidence, the chain of command, and, like, how everything needs to be done at the crime scenes. In order to summarize about 50 pages of this book, I'll read out to you the answer as to what she was actually striving to. Because you can see somebody who is really doing everything, and at this point she's in her 60s, who is really doing everything in her power to just create resources, to educate all of these people in different areas, on different medical legal kind of knowledge. So, when she was asked what is the overall picture, the final attainment aimed at, she said to make available scientific, medical, legal, or other skill and knowledge 
for the solution of otherwise unexplained deaths, accidents, or those crimes concerned with personal injury and death, in order to determine the cause of death where it's obscure, to recognize preventable hazards of public health and to life, and to clear the innocent and expose the guilty. And the way that she intended to do this would be by simplifying and improving the medical examiner system where it already exists, by providing a medical examiner system in place of the prevalent coroner system, by improving the quality of medical and other scientific services available to the state, by usually increasing knowledge and training, etc., etc. So, at this point, she still doesn't have really that department she intended to create. However, in 1943, Lee would be appointed consultant to the Department of Legal Medicine. And at this point, Harvard Medical School still wouldn't even admit female students for two more years. This woman was a bad, bad bitch. On top of that, she was commissioned as a captain by the New Hampshire police that same year. And she would be the first woman in the United States to hold such a rank. At this point, she's 66 years old, as I mentioned. At this point, she's 66 years old. So, even though she had had health issues now, I mean, a lot of people would decide, let's just fucking retire. Nope. Lee decides that this is the perfect time for her to actually put her vision into the works, into the training for the police force. Her suggestion would be an intensive course, one-week seminar at the library that she had been funding and commissioning all of this time. The specialized training was to be covering all of these areas, creating the professional medical legal investigator, standardizing the requirements, everything from training them in basic skills, acquainting them with general types of, like, admin stuff that they will need to fill out, stipulating them with further knowledge, teaching the police officers of legal medicine to be seekers of the truth, instilling the ability to improve the profession into them, and the most important part, and the one to wrap it all up, would be the crime scene. She didn't want them to be at the actual crime scene the way that she was. Or rather, she wanted them to have some training before going to their first crime scene. So, she thought of her orchestra diorama. She hired a carpentry guy, but most of the work, again, was done by her. So, this would be in the midst of the Second World War. This woman is looking for replacement parts. She's looking for materials. She's looking for jewelry. Finally, she puts this into place where she actually has the name for her dioramas, for her 3D miniatures. She decided to call them the Nutshell Models. The full name would be the Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death. So, at first, she decided on the scale, the same proportions that she used for her Chicago Symphony Orchestra. The very first diorama would have actually been based on a case that McGrath had investigated, of a man who hanged himself under suspicious circumstances. Due to the background, due to how she would actually approach these crime scenes with McGrath, she also always wanted to provide a background story. So, when they were based on real-life cases, she would say that. She would give sort of a real background story. Like in this case, that the dead man was an unpleasant, manipulative fellow who repeatedly coerced his wife by threatening suicide until he got his way. Especially if the deaths were real, but also just even in the fictional ones, she really spared no expense to make, A, the models look realistic, and the way that she would do this is representing things correctly. So, let's say you have rigor mortis, where the muscles on a human are to stiffen. Well, that needs to be represented differently on a doll. So, making those body parts by hand. Same with furniture. Same with bloods, for example. Like, dressing the dolls, making sure that they are in the right clothes. Nail polish, 
using nail polish for blood, if they were to be hanged, how would you showcase strangulation? Like, the rope needs to fit the doll neck perfectly, making the floors look like they have aged, making the bathrooms look like they have been overflowing, or, I don't know, that the clog has been stuck, just, like, trying to think about every single thing. There is one that I have analyzed before, where she had literally made the mirror in the bathroom look all fogged up to be like, well, did the person, you know, have the shower? At what point? How far before their body was discovered? It's just so brilliant. But you have to pay attention to literally every single detail of these miniatures. By the estimates, each diorama would actually cost, in today's money, over 30000 Between 30000 and $60,000. And the first week-long seminar in homicide investigation for police officer would see the light of day in 1945. So, two sessions would be held each year, in April and October, at the McGrath Library. She would ensure that the attendance was by invitation only, and she was interviewing people who were to commit to training to see that they're actually serious about it, that they're not wasting a place in the classroom for another graduate. She insisted that the officers don't pay for the training, rather that it be the law enforcement agency. And also then, during the week of the seminar, officers would hear lectures about blunt force, stabbing injuries, asphyxiation, poisoning, and then they would observe the autopsy performed by one of the senior morticians, and then they would interact with the nutshell studies. So, at the end of the first day, each officer would be assigned two nutshell dioramas to study. They were given about 90 minutes to observe each one, and then later in the week, they would stand before the class and give a verbal report. So, after some discussion, then the point intended to be illustrated by each model was actually shared with them. What is so fascinating to me, and why I will never stop obsessing about this story, is that we don't have the keys. We don't have the solutions. I will go through two dioramas with you right now, but we don't know what the outcome is. I mean, maybe you are like, yeah, I'm 100% sure, but the keys, the solutions, are under the lock and key somewhere. I don't know where, it just the book just says under the lock and key, and that is what is truly fascinating to me, because it's unattainable knowledge. It's just so brilliant, and there's only a limited amount of people that knew the ins and outs of it, that knew what she actually wanted to represent, that know for sure, and had known for sure whether it was accident, whether it was foul play. And that, to me, is just so, uh, like, to my curious mind, it just never stops being so fascinating. This bitch really was such a badass that she just didn't reveal the solutions to everybody. Just, like, bringing secrets to your grave. There's something about it that feeds the Scorpio in me. At the same time that the seminars would begin, she formed a non-profit organization that she called HUPS, Harvard Associates in Police Science. At the conclusion of each and every seminar, she would rise and speak to the group, saying that there is no place for guesswork in the sort of police work whatever, especially not in homicide investigation. The investigator seeks out the truth, the whole naked, incontrovertible truth. Let it finish where it may. She would emphasize that the goal of the exercises was always to observe, recognize evidence that may be significant, and report the findings that each diorama is a moment frozen in time, like a still frame from a motion picture. The dioramas are a set of facts, the truth in a nutshell. It is the investigator's duty to search for the truth. So, let us analyze two of them. One of them that we are analyzing is called Parsonage Parlor. So, I'll put it on the screen and just summarize the background story. Usually, it entails, like, how the body was found, who the witness was, who called the police, that kind of stuff. So, here we have two witnesses. One of them is a mother, and then the other one was a police officer. We have the deceased, we have the information that she was a high school student, and also the date of her death. And you also then have some additional information on the temperature, the weather during the week. So, what you see is Dorothy Dennison dead on the floor of the parsonage. 
the knife in her abdomen, her legs slightly spread and her dress pulled up, the hammer lying not far from her head and blood saturating the floor. And then you would go through this miniature, through this diorama rather, the way that you were to mark a crime scene, with sort of numbers of like how you're approaching the evidence. So at first you pay attention to the covered chair and the piano. Did nobody live here? Is the furniture covered? Who has the keys? Is there blood on the piano and on the stool? Is it possible that she was attacked from behind when she was set there? Then you have to pay attention to the body. Is she lying in a natural position? Why are her legs spread? The bite marks on her body should be photographed and impressions taken. Were the bite marks pre or post-mortem? When it comes to the weapon, well, it's on the scene. Is there a toolbox nearby? You know, did the weapon belong to her or was it brought to the scene? Did the hammer kill her or was it the knife? Because there's a knife in her abdomen. The belongings, the purse and the package, both are very neat on the chair. There is a hamburger on the scene as well, and that could corroborate the timeline of the witness statements, it could corroborate whatever they find in this victim's stomach. So this is what the police officers would be working with, because here, well, clearly it seems like Dorothy Dennison had been murdered. But then you have to assess it against the witness statements. And the witness statement here by the mother was that Dorothy walked downtown to buy some hamburger steak for dinner. That she didn't have much money in her purse and when she didn't return in time for dinner, she called a neighbor who said that she has been walking towards the market but that she hadn't seen her since. She called the market and Dorothy bought hamburger sometime before noon, but they didn't notice where she then turned and left. By late afternoon, the mom called the police. So you have to take that into consideration with the food that you have found, because clearly she made it to the market and then whatever happened, happened afterwards. Then there was a witness that was a police officer who said that he took the phone call from the mother at the police headquarters and at once they took this matter seriously. They also give the time of when they entered the parsonage and found Dorothy. And then you have the temperature, you have the weather at the time. So does that match up? I don't know how the blood had congealed on the floor. You really have to use all of the observation skills in order to try to figure anything here out. So let me know what you think about this miniature. Do you think it is foul play? What do you think had happened? I don't know, in my head something definitely happened after the market because she bought the hamburger. But what drives me insane is like, why is she at this place? Like, why is the furniture covered? What's going on there? It's just, we just lack information. And she does it by purpose. She does it on purpose. I just know it. <laughs> I just know it. Listen, I can enter Francis's mind. She did this all to torture me, in particular, like, a century later. Can you do math? Is it a century later, Maya? Please don't make me do math right now. <laughs> I can't make deductions about this crime scene. Let me know what you think about this diorama. Can you crack it? Why is the furniture covered? I really want to know, because um, it doesn't make much sense. Like, why is she living in a place with covered furniture? The next diorama we are going to analyze is called the Red Bedroom. Okay, so here, the background story. Marie Jones, a prostitute, let's call it sex worker, please, was discovered dead by her landlady, Miss Shirley Flanagan. Shirley, the witness, would give a following statement. On that evening, she was passing by an open room and called out, hello. She didn't hear the response, she looked in and found the conditions as were found in the model or the doll. The witness also said that the boyfriend and the client of Marie's came in to see Marie the afternoon before, but she doesn't know when he left. And as soon as she found the body, she obviously alerted the police, who then later tracked down the boyfriend and brought him in for questioning. The boyfriend said that he walked with Marie to a nearby store where he bought two bottles of whiskey. Then they went into the room where they sat smoking and drinking for some time. Marie was sitting in the red chair and she got super drunk. Suddenly, without any warning, she grabbed his open jackknife, 
which he had used to cut the string around the package containing the bottles. Okay, the boyfriend here is giving way, way too many details. The boyfriend is fucking sus. Then she ran into the closet, shutting the door. When he opened the door, he found her lying, as represented by the model. And he left the house immediately after that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Not suspicious at all, Jim. Jim Green, with the most basic name at all. So, what you see, you see Marie dead in the closet in the small room, her throat cut and her head lying on the cardboard box, the murder weapon next to her body. Then, if you pay attention, you can see the rag and the bottles, so there are indeed two bottles of whiskey. Maybe Jim isn't lying, after all. There's a rag which looks like it's covered in blood, should be collected and tested. There's an open box of candy. Who bought the candy? Jim didn't say anything. Well, Jim, question Jim right now about the fucking candy. Why did he say two bottles but no candy? What's in the candy? Test the candy. The body. Why are the bangles around the wrists? The alcohol in the blood needs to be tested to again confirm Jim's shady ass story. Then there is the glass. All of the dresser drawers are open as well. Are they empty? Have they been emptied? Is this a robbery gone wrong? There's a glass randomly in the middle of the floor. What is in the glass? It needs to be tested. Then there's the suitcase with the open dresser drawers. Was she in a hurry? Was she packing up? What is in the damn suitcase? It will always, forever drive me insane. Let me know what you think about this one. Jim is shady, I'm telling you. <laughs> I don't know him personally because he's not even in this little diorama, but he's fucking shady. So, now going back into the life of Frances Glessner Lee, and rather really the aftermath. After, you know, these seminars have been done, she has been obviously featured. She has in particular been featured by a life photographer that spent several days at Harvard shooting the dioramas. Magazine wanted to present to the readers as if they were students in the seminar, with each brief, with a report, just corresponding with each diorama. And obviously this magazine wanted to know the solutions, they wanted to have everything on the ready, and this is when Frances was insisting that participating in the story was a huge opportunity to bring legal medicine to the national audiences. So she was honored, but on the other hand, if everybody knew the solutions, the value of the nutshells would drop to zero. So she compromised and allowed life to print with statements, things that we have today, but not the complete report used during the homicide seminar. She let the magazine reveal some clues, but she also withheld the solutions, as she still did to this very day, so that's why we don't have them. What I personally think would have mattered to Frances the most was the feedback that she was getting from the police officers. By this point, the female police officers were also attending these seminars, and by 1949, the seminars had been attended by officers from 19 states, and also two Canadian provinces, special agents of the FBI and also the US Army military police. And meanwhile, the proceeds in the form of the registration fees would go to the Department of Legal Medicine, which we has helped, found, and also has then helped ever since support financially. There was a book written based on Lee. There was also a film that was made, or as I put in the script, film was written on her, sure. And this is one of those MGM productions. It's kind of like film noir. At first, it was supposed to be called Murder at Harvard, but then later the name had been changed. Murder at Harvard became Mystery Street. I'll play some part of it that I found, like, a trailer online. It would represent bullet wound models and mannequin heads, but it wouldn't really represent nutshell studies. It wouldn't really showcase any dioramas, and the profits from it also would go to the department. Man murdered Vivian Heldon. The scientist said, don't be too sure. Then, circumstantial evidence through its ever-tightening net around the bewildered man. Are you all sure now? That's him, I'll swear that's the guy. He's lying, that man. Yeah, that's the one. one. I never saw him before. Can you ask about this? Now, climb him into the electric chair. Oh, no, darling, no. I made a lot of mistakes. Open up. 
for us that one. This movie was revolutionary for the time, not just because it was inspired by women's work, not just even because it was that she created a whole S department, but it was the first modern procedural crime drama. And as we know today, there's plenty of those. But back then, people didn't really watch them. They were really scared of, like, representation of crime scenes. And also, it kind of directed Frances into finally realizing, I believe, her power. Like, knowing that, hey, there's a book written on me. I have gotten feedback. Like, there's female officers that have now been trained using my program. And I'm not really getting appreciated. The forensic pathologist, Moritz, that basically took her kind of under her wing and worked with her before, took the job as the director of pathology. But Lee didn't like this direction, and she didn't like it because Moritz seemed to always be interested in his career rather than in the studies, rather than in legal medicine. So Lee had to come to learn that everything was suddenly uncertain. The book that she was working on herself, this whole MGM movie, the homicide seminars, even the Department of Legal Medicine itself. Moritz would end up being replaced by a guy with last name Ford, and Lee really equally disliked him, because under Ford, really, no research had been done. So she finally decided, I'm going to pull out. I'm going to basically not make them have the profit off of my hard work, because this is what they have been doing so far. So finally, she would continue to use Harvard for her homicide seminars, but she withdrew any other support from the department. After the natural studies were featured in life, she would also be featured in numerous other newspaper stories, in national magazines, like the Saturday Evening Post, Coronet, Yankee, Popular Mechanics, and also many others. According to the book, the angle of a wealthy elderly woman who made doll's houses of death was irresistible. It just had never happened before. But instead of this going into her head, Frances continued to want to focus on legal medicine, rather than on herself, at least during her lifetime. And then in 1950, at the age of 73, she faced the greatest challenge to date. She got a cancer diagnosis. This time, though, she knew that the end was close, so she formed the advisory board that consisted of five people that she found most trustworthy and fully informed of her vision of legal medicine. This was her daughter that was on the advisory board, the former U.S. Army judge, superintendent of the state police, and former Air Force criminal investigator, and the FBI agent, and also her banker. And this would be the letter that she would write to them that was labeled top secret, where she offered some advice as to, like, how she wants this run in the aftermath of her death. But also, she kind of did finally express some frustrations about just how hard this was for her, just creating this department, and also how necessary it is to continue with actual research and not just research, but then educating people based off of anything new that comes within the industry. She ended the letter saying, My whole object has been to improve the administration of justice, to standardize the methods, to sharpen the existing tools, and to make it easier for the law enforcement officers to do a good job and to give the public a square deal. As for the Harvard, she had said, I warn you each and every one that Harvard is clever and sly, and will need to be watched constantly, or she will take advantage of you and apply any funds you may grant her to her own purposes. This has been so marked a tendency in my lifetime that I have preferred to spend the money myself to procure what I wanted, and then to give the results to Harvard. I suggest, when possible, you do the same. Despite of her increasing disabilities, despite of her advancing age, heart disease, and different fractures on her body, she would maintain a busy schedule for the remaining 11 years of her life. She would go to the FBI yet again. However, this time in 1951, she didn't meet up with Hoover. She rather had to schedule a meeting with somebody else. 
in the mid 1950s harvard also kind of started pushing her gently towards the door at this point she was 76 though so it did make sense but again she was pissed within reason because they asked her to retire there was a mandatory age of retirement for the university so in 1954 they finally basically asked her to go and they have given the office to somebody else. In a different type of letter, Lee would have some final reflections upon her life, saying, as I sit quietly here, an old woman, I think back over my life and realize what a wonderfully rich life it has been. Recently, I read somewhere that when we are young, we cannot understand the problems of the old, for we haven't experienced them yet ourselves. And when we are old, we have largely forgotten the problems of the young. But I haven't forgotten. And I believe I'm nearer a sympathetic understanding of the problems of those younger than they think possible. Anyway, it's a good world, and I'm grateful I have been given a chance to play a part in it. In 1961, she would get a letter from the Department of Legal Medicine with the heartbreaking news. There was some snow and ice on the roof of the building where the nutshell studies were kept, and several dioramas suffered some water damage. The most serious one was the large model of the center of the room, and this one she really couldn't repair. However, she still inspected them, she still invested into making some repairs wherever possible, and then they had them back in their cabinets in the time for 1961 year seminar and this is going to be the last seminar that she attended because her cancer returned again. Frances Glessner Lee would end up dying at her home at the Rocks on 27th of January 1962. This would only be a month short of her 84th birthday. Her own cause of death would be the intestinal obstruction that was related to liver cancer that then metastasized from breast cancer. She also had some accumulation of fluid in the abdominal cavity because of the liver failure, and then the heart failure that produced generalized swelling of her body. Her funeral would be attended at the Little Thurn Church, and it would be attended by the employees of the Rocks, most of the staff at the Department of Legal Medicine, six of the state police officers of New Hampshire, and she would end up being buried on the Maple Street Cemetery in New Hampshire, Bethlehem. The legacy of Frances Glessner Lee really speaks volumes, because during her lifetime, she had numerous honors and awards that were given to her. The Honorary Doctorate of Laws from New England College, the Honorary Law Degree from Pennsylvania Drexel University, she was the Honorary Captain for multiple police forces, and in recognition of her extraordinary contributions to the advancement of legal medicine and forensic pathology, she was also given a whole category at the Institute of Medicine of Chicago, named Citizen Fellow of the Institute of Medicine. One recognition that she had never been granted, and the one that the book writer thinks that she would have appreciated the most, would have been the honorary degree from Harvard. In the end, Harvard really did Francis Glasner dirty. In the end, Harvard really did Francis dirty. They still don't have the forensic pathologist on the medical school staff, and the only commemoration that they have done of Lee was through this Francis Glessner Lee Professor of Legal Medicine appointment. And this position right now is held by a pediatric anesthesiologist, who is also the director of the Center of the Bioethics. So I suppose they still wanted to basically keep her legacy going, but still not in the right way, never. Never as powerfully as she has committed her whole life to this university, and just never really cared. Moritz eventually died, Ford eventually died, and Lee would have left an estate. And when I say an estate, this is the Glessner family home. There are pictures online of it. It is now called the Glessner House Museum. Like, this is the home where she had actually grown up. And according to the magazines and according to its own website, the Glessner House represents architect Henry Hobson Richardson's response to the Glessner's desire for a simple, comfortable home that retained the cozy feeling of their previous home on West Washington Street. 
According to the book, at the time it was written, which was 2020, the Francis Glessner Lee seminars in homicide investigations would still be held at Forensic Medical Center. This would be in Maryland, in Baltimore. The students still receive a diploma that says Harvard Associates in Police Science and the HUPS label PIN. And every seminar still has a group picture in order to commemorate it. The nutshell studies of unexplained death are still used exactly as we intended them to be, for training police officers to observe and to report their findings. However, these are still miniatures, these are still dioramas that just degrade with time. So Smithsonian took them and they have had to go under extensive conservation by the experts. And then they took them and they kind of displayed them through 2017 and 2018. They were open for visit whoever, whoever actually went to public exhibition. Please post in the comments. I have seen just pictures on their website, but like they were displayed at Smithsonian Randwick Gallery. That's located just streets away from the White House. Like... This woman has done just so much good work and I just want to know everybody who has been in touch with it, who has been trained by her or who has visited this exhibition, just to see what you felt in the presence of greatness. Post in the comments right the fuck now. Post this video. Post it. After this exhibition that was dubbed Murder is Her Hobby, the dioramas were packed and they are now in the cabinets in the Forensic Medical Center in Baltimore. They continue to be used in the homicide seminars by all accounts, but the nutshell studies are not open to general public anymore. That's why I want you to post in the comments. It's clear. It's very clear. <laughs> like, because you're obsessed. Because <laughs> it's an obsession. And I love it as people do with obsessions generally. Today, despite all Francis's work, there is still a lot to be done when it comes to death investigations. There are still no federal laws or national standards regulating how unexplained deaths should be investigated. There's little consistencies from place to place, the person's qualifications still differ, the conditions under which a forensic investigation is indicated, how it is conducted as well. The situation when it comes to coroners and how involved they are with the investigation still is to change, as about half of the total American population is still under the jurisdiction of the coroners. Since Frances Lee established the first training program at Harvard's Department of Legal Medicine, though, the number of forensic pathology fellowship courses in the U.S. has grown to 39. And yes, even though the medical examiner systems have been slow to spread throughout much of the world, her influence actually extends a lot more beyond the U.S., there are other police officers from around the world that have attended Francis Glessner Lee's seminar in homicide investigations and also HUP seminars. Methods that she has shown have been still practiced and still are daily by investigators around the world. Her dioramas played part of the exhibit here in London at the Welcome Collection in 2015. She has also inspired different BBC radio shows television series called Tracks Across America, miniature killer plot on the CSI, just even beyond her time. These are like all recent, you know, 2000 and from that point on. These aren't just like film noir, black and white films, first procedural dramas. This woman has had a huge influence and still continues to have it to this very day. And the reasons for the lack of responsiveness still don't differ from the time that Frances Lee was growing up, was creating these seminars, and was creating these dioramas and then ensuring that they're used in training for years to come. The lack of resources, the lack of funding, the lack of training and adherence to standards of practice, and also the lack of support. But against all odds, one woman has proven that the pursuit of truth must be relentless. As Captain Lee reminded us, scientific facts must be followed wherever they lead to clear the innocent and convict the guilty. And that is the story of Frances Glessner Lee, the badass grandma. I love her. I love her so much. She's so, like, dear to my heart. I loved reading this random-ass book that I have found. Of 
course I would. Of course I would. Come on. It had to be. And now the miniatures are out of my system. We never again we are speaking about them. <laughs> just what you find. Like actual book just focused on dioramas by some nutter. By some complete nutter online. If you are a nutter, if you... There must be somebody analyzing. There must be somebody believing that they know the solutions to each and every one. And to you I say, get in touch. <laughs> To the rest of you, I say, please share this type of content with other people online so they find me on the internet. Make sure to like and subscribe and put the bell on and keep your eyes on the community posts. And I will let you know in the community posts once I'm back. I might even give clues as to what book I'm reading next. And yeah, I mean, if you do manage to like monetize me one day to the point where you know me returning to every week video makes sense then good job good job you i will be eternally grateful if i were to create my job for youtube that would be the dream the dream of all dreams but for now i shall be sticking to the deep dives once i'm back from spain i'll be all tan i'll be looking so good <laughs> yeah it will look exactly the same. You'll be just red in the face with the skin peeling. Shut it. Shut it. I shall be seeing you shortly. Put some respect to Francis's name and do not call the woman Fanny. She liked it. I don't. What is with the Britishness and Fanny's? <laughs> this is how she's ending the video. Okay. I'm out now. I'm out. I'm out. I just gave up on me. Wow, right in the time. You might have... You didn't even pay attention to it. You could have given up on you like 20 minutes earlier. Did you? Well, we'll see. We'll have to find out and see. They, they'll tell you in the comments. You can rewind, Maya. You are editing this right now. <laughs>